But it might be that people say, no, actually, when I do it right 100 times in a row, I'm not actually challenging myself. I'm not taking the right kind of risks. I'm not allowing myself to try a new way of doing it. So good is actually not doing it right 100 times in a row. Good is failing maybe 30% of the time, maybe more, <laughs> because it's from the failures that I'm going to learn how to do it even better than I ever could have before. A startup I am joined by um, Sean Kelly. Um, welcome, Sean. Thanks for having me, Julian. So Sean uh, is sitting in for Chris while Chris is, I think, on a flight from D.C. or something, um, something fancy. Uh, Sean, you are a professor at Harvard, professor of philosophy. And now I know you are a very humble you know, person. I'll try to hype you up a little bit, um, <laughs> maybe more than you would yourself. Um, okay. So... Now, as a philosophy student myself, I knew of Sean before knowing Sean. And uh, I think you're the top living expert on Heidegger. Is that fair to say? Oh, I, I would never say it myself. I have so many friends who know so much about Heidegger, but I certainly am interested in him. And uh, I think he's an important, although a thinker, although a complicated person. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think it's more than fair to say that you are, you know, amongst the top kind of active philosophers um, in the world. Uh, there are folks that, um, you know, like Charles Taylor that I've, you know, worked with who are presumably like a little bit like, um, you know, ha 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 uh, more uh, it could take that title as well, but are less active today and not you know writing. Um, so so as far as I can tell, you're really like the top guy who's like actually active and young enough to be working. Um, I don't know. It, 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 is this overhyping you or like I I, <laughs> I I feel so starstruck when I spend time with you. Well, I'll just say that's very kind of you, Julian, and I'm I'm grateful for the description. But I did, I, you know, we have talked before. I didn't, I don't think I knew, or maybe I knew and forgot that you had studied philosophy and mm. you had read some of my things before we started talking. That's good to know. I'm happy to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did one year. I I was only in college for one year. Oh, good. Okay. Um, yes. And my the, the major Royal Road was to, philosophy. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So, I mean, philosophy is a, a kind of amazing and crazy discipline. And I came to it late. I, because uh, I thought I wanted to do math and computer science. I did a lot of math and computer science. And it wasn't until my third year of graduate school in math that I finally switched to philosophy. And maybe that's not unrelated to, to what I think you want to talk about today. Um, because I think I felt like there was something that was absent in the sort of way I was spending my life. I loved math. I loved thinking about complicated issues in math, and I loved thinking about um, sort of you know, what it would take to go about proving that they were true or not true. I love the elegance of it. There's something very exciting about getting it when you do. Um, and yet I felt like when I was doing it, I somehow wasn't being the best version of myself. And uh, that was only partly because there were other people who were better at it than me. It, it, I mean, that's always going to be true. It was also because... I felt like as interesting as it was, um, I didn't feel alive when I was when when I was doing it in the full way I had hoped I might be able to. So that's part of the topic that I think you're interested in talking about today. Yeah. So what we'll do? You wrote a um, New York Times piece many years ago, I think in 2016. Um, so. Maybe, maybe even you wrote it before Trump was president, which feels like, uh -huh. um, 
you know, a, a, another a generation ago. Yeah. A Alas, era, I, I and I only know this because I reread it in preparation for this. It was Dece it was published December twenty fifth, two thousand seventeen, and mm. I was reading through as I was reading through the comments just an hour ago. Um, yeah, some people were referring to the fact that Trump had been in office for a year. So okay, so, yeah, so it was the at the beginning one. of the Trump presidency. And yes. what we'll do is just discuss that a little bit, so like a, a brief summary. Then we'll apply some of the you know learnings to what you do at Dunster House. So you're uh, at Harvard. So Harvard College has these houses that um, the undergrads live in, and uh, one of them is called Dunster House, and you're the kind of faculty head of that house. So we'll kind of apply it to that, and then we'll bring it into you know the startup space. Let's say cap houses uh, applicable to uh, startups and the startup culture, which is such a huge part of um, of running a business. Great. Great. Okay. Well, I, you know, I, so I'll start. I, I am, I should say, so I'm, the title is faculty dean. So, but you were right to call it the faculty head of a house of 450 students, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Um, but along with my wife, we're the co-faculty dean, Cheryl and I. And uh, that's already something that's fascinating and wonderful. Uh, but yeah, part of what we do is we try to build community in the house and make it a place that people want to be in. So part of the question that you're interested in, I think, that we should all be interested in is what makes a place, a place that people want to be in, pursuing things together? That's what a business is. And uh, so in the background, that's that's a, a big question that I have in mind. But it, it started out with a somewhat smaller question. Um, that I came to through teaching um, a bunch of courses that I teach here and have taught at other places before I got here um, on uh, courses on sort of a tradition called existentialism. Um, and existentialism is a tradition, very briefly and in, in caricature, a tradition that thinks about um, what it is to be human like what what's the characteristic feature of human beings and it's as it, the sort of thought is if you understood that better then you could understand what we're aiming at at living human lives well and uh so the piece that you're referring to is a piece that i wrote um while i was teaching this course on existentialism and it's actually a, it i i wrote it for my students and then um and then had the opportunity to publish it. So it came out in the New York Times on Christmas Day, which is, turns out to have been a brilliant sort of uh, sort of um, idea on the editor's part, because I think a lot of people were ready to read a piece uh, on a day like that. Um, and not everybody who was commenting on it was Christian, but the day is a sort of day of reflection for many people. And so a lot of people were excited to read a piece about sort of what what makes a human life sort of worth living? Why would you want to? Why you know? Why would you want to live it? And what does it take to live it well? And that's so that's what the piece was about. In the background, and it doesn't come out in the piece. So I'll tell you the secret backstory of, of the piece. Um, it, the the editors again, brilliant stroke. They called it um, the gift of aliveness, and aliveness is the name for. Uh, is the word for the thing that a particular philosopher I was interested in, this French philosopher from the 17th century named Blaise Pascal, um, says at a certain point is the key to living life. You, you have to aim at a, a, um, a sense of aliveness. And I was teaching, so the, the, that's in the piece. The back story, the secret part that's not in the piece is that that semester, I had decided after many years of refusing to do it to teach a different French philosopher and novelist named Albert Camus. Camus is, you know, sort of lived in the 20th century. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Many of your listeners will have read some of his novels. He also wrote a long essay called The Myth of Sisyphus. And um, the reason I never taught that is because 
the opening line from that is just so disturbing to me that I, I, I always felt it, it put me in the wrong mood to get anything out of it. So I didn't know how I could help the students get anything out of it. So, and the opening line is something like, um, translated into English, something like the, uh, there is only one important question of philosophy and that's the question of suicide. And uh, somehow suicide is the name for the opposite of what you have when when things are going great. So it's the it's the extreme opposite. And the whole Camus essay is about, you know, whether we have to confront this question. Uh, should we commit suicide? That's a question we have to confront because uh, there's a question about what life is capable of offering us. And if, as he was thinking in the mid 20th century, just after World War II, you know, the sort of the world is decimated. Maybe it was in the middle of World War II. I can't remember when it was written. Um, uh, and, and in the midst of a kind of deadening onset of technologization and lots of manufacturing work at, you know, sort of, uh, uh, Oh, I don't know, sort of places where the work you do is completely deadening, uh, where you do the same thing over and over and over again. In, in the face of that, uh, you know, should we commit suicide is what Camus is asking. And the answer he gives is no, which is good. I was happy about that. But it, but it, but it turns out that I, I thought it was strange um, the reason he gives the reason he gives is that um, the world is utterly meaningless, utterly meaningless. There's nothing that we could ever do in our lives that would be meaningful. Um, we recognize that day after day when you get into a routine, you get up in the morning, you have your coffee, you go to work, you do your work, it's dumb, you're bored, you're, oh, you know, you, you can't take it, you take a lunch break, nothing interesting happens, you go home at the end of the day and then you do it the, all over again the next day. That's his description of what modern life is like. And he says, yes, that's that's meaningless. There's nothing meaningless. Uh, there's nothing meaningful about it. Um, but it's worse than that because um, you can come to recognize every once in a while that you're not focused on the fact that it's meaningless. In fact, you're just assuming that it must be meaningful. And it's only in these moments where you look really carefully that you're able or, or you're driven to a, a, a state of despair or something that you can come to recognize that no, in fact, uh, it's not just that it, it it's it's it, it's presenting itself as if it were meaningful, but then when you look hard, you see that abyss underneath it, and there's nothing there. And he has this amazing metaphor. He says it's like looking at a guy talk on a telephone behind a plate glass window. He says the dumb show of his existence is absurd. <laughs> and so that's his description of life. And the question is, should we, maybe we should just commit suicide in the face of it. And he says, no, our lives really are like the life of Sisyphus rolling the boulder up the hill every day in the Greek myth and finally taking all day to get to the top and finally getting there. And then it's rolling back down and through the course of the night, he descends and then does the same thing. That's our life, he says. And we didn't choose it. Something put us here. I don't know what it was. Nature, the environment, the universe, the gods, whatever it was. Um, and there's nothing we can do about it except that we can laugh in the face of it. <laughs> that's the one bit of choice that we've got. We can refuse to commit suicide and that's the act of rebellion, the only authentic act of rebellion that we can be involved in. That's, it's, it's such a striking position and such a, uh, I mean, and there's such deep insight into aspects of the modern condition that it's really deeply compelling to read. But it felt to me like there was something missing. 
it felt to me like the description that he wanted to give of our daily existence was lacking something. And I try, and this piece that I wrote is an attempt to say what it what was lacking, although Camus never shows up in the piece. And so what's lacking, I think, is this, that it's not just when you look at your life, um, it seems as if it's meaningful, but on reflection, you can see there's nothing there. It's that it seems as if it's meaningful, but on reflection, you can't understand where that meaning could possibly come from. And that's a sort of deep mystery that draws you into it even more. And, and so my example of that is in the article, in the essay, and it's taken out of context, but it's, a, it's the example of um, looking into your lover's eyes. When you look into your lover's eyes, if you are in love with someone, your life is alive and there's something amazing about it. And you know that the sort of sight of aliveness is that person. And so you look at them to find out where it comes from. And the more you look, say, into their eyes, the more you see that whatever it is that's there, that's awesome and meaningful and has to be preserved, is something that's always just beyond your reach because it can't just be the physical eyeball, it's something else. The eyes are the window to the soul and the soul is nothing you can see. So that's the phenomenon that I'm after. And I think when you're in really great, community situations, very, really great, meaningful, personal situations, when you're in the midst of a project um, that was really deeply meaningful to you, or when you've come together with a team to really build something, it's animated by that kind of vivacity and, and aliveness. So I, that's the phenomenon that I was trying to describe in the piece. And I think it's the phenomenon that it's at least one possible phenomenon that we could all aim at sort of, um, I don't know, getting a handle on in our own lives. Yeah, it's interesting. There's um, like when you were describing the Camus uh, you know, description of life, my that definitely aligns with how I felt about my life when I had a job, which to be mm -hmm. fair, I only did for two years. So I'm not, yeah. um, I, yeah. I worked in a big bank for two years. So I don't know yeah. if everybody feels that way all the time, but uh, I suspect they do. Absolutely. And um, as an entrepreneur or as a leader of any community organization, which includes, you know, Dunster House, but would include, you know, startup uh, that I'd be leading or that are uh, a, a business that our listeners would be leading, you know, when you're designing the culture, you should be designing the culture for the opposite of that. You should be designing the culture for, uh, and here I'll quote uh, you. Um, oh. So here, <laughs> to be alive is to have the passion of Casanova without its isolation, inconsistency and despair, or the resolute uh, uh, certainty of Kant without its monotony and insignificance. And I like that because there's th th there are kind of like two poles to this. Like one is a sense of like dynamism and engagedness. Um, the other is a sense of um, you know purpose and um, you know rightfulness or, or kind of like where you're pursuing the thing that should be pursued. Um, and, and that's kind of like, so the Casanova is kind of like the dynamism. Kant is a, uh, like pursuing the, the thing that should be pursued. And uh, that in pursuing it, you are creating, uh, you know, value and meaning and contributing just because you are pursuing it. Uh, so mm -hmm. let's say it's like the opposite of lying, let's say. Um, yes. Yeah. And, and, and I think we can all, as humans, and pro like kind of, we know what that feels like, right? Like there are times in our lives where we feel that 
there was a lot of dynamism and we were pursuing the things that should be pursued. And um, I assume for you as a professor, you feel that more often and as an entrepreneur, you also do feel that more often than, you know, most corporate employees would, um, you know, given our context. Well, I, I, there's different parts of being a professor. And so I will, there are the parts that are the day-to-day drudgery. There's plenty of it, much more than I was prepared for when I chose this life. Um, But that said, it's a very, it's an amazing position because there are lots of opportunities um, to have the opposite. And for me, it happens in three places, really. One, um, a major one is in the classroom. When a class is going well, there's a special thing that happens when a class is going well. And maybe, I mean, I've been in meetings where this works too, you know, so it could it could happen in a business meeting or on a team or something. The, um, a, the special thing that's happening, that happens when it's going well, is that A, it's not clear where it's going to end up because it's not, predetermined it's i mean there's a there's a way of running a class where you come in and you know where it's ending <laughs> and it's just a matter of engineering the you know the the group to get there that's not that's not in my way of thinking about it genuine teaching genuine teaching really has to involve the capacity of the person who's the teacher being open to the possibility that they're going to learn something from what other people say. And so you have to really give up control in when in order to do that. I go in knowing a lot about whatever text it is that we are gonna talk about, but I don't think of it as my job primarily to tell people what I know. Who wants to hear that? I take it my job to spark enough interest in the text that people will want to engage with it in a particular way. And that'll draw out of me particular ways of thinking about, you know, what needs to be said, which will then spur more from them. And when it, when that happens, especially when it happens in a big group with a lot of people involved in it, it really feels exciting. I mean, just exciting is the word on the edge of your seat. Some of the time, I mean, you don't know where it's going to end up. And you don't know if it's, it might fail. That's like the, it's a huge risk every time, but that's what makes it possible for it to be exciting is that everybody's on the edge of their seat. And as long as it turns out pretty well, at least some of the time, people are going to want to come back and you're going to want to come back. Um, So, yeah, so that's one place where it happens. It also happens definitely in the community, in the living community that we are engaged in. It also happens um, in my own sort of individual writing projects. So those are the three legs of it for me. And there's a component of this, which is, uh, and I think it's particularly important for startups, which is like when you have this feeling of aliveness, right? So when you feel, and, 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 and I like to your, your example of you know being a prof in front of a group because it highlights the fact that there's some type of nonverbal communication that's happening between a large amount of people, right? Like so, in your class, you're mostly talking, but there's something like other people do participate somewhat, I'm sure, but uh, everyone is participating, um, although not in a way that would be. Um, you know, notable, let's say for me, when I listen to the recordings of your, of your courses, um, noticeable for me. Um, so there's, you know, this kind of like communication and coordination and, uh, you know, something that happens that draws everybody in, um, you know, in a nonverbal manner and it may, maybe, you know, conscious, but, you know, somehow subconscious as well. Um, and as a entrepreneur, uh, that's actually the feeling you want to create because this is something you've told me, uh, when people feel that way, they kind of 
put aside their own interests for the interests of the broader group. Um, and this kind of like feeling of purpose, this feeling of aliveness, this feeling of like flow, um, it, 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 like really is a prerequisite to putting aside your own interests uh, for the interests of the group. Can, can you kind of like elaborate on that? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing I'll say is that it is, it's hard. I mean, I, I first experienced it, you know, from my great teacher, Bert Dreyfus, uh, who was an amazing philosopher and who's written work, you know, will, will last for many centuries, uh, but whose real contribution was as a teacher. I mean, he was just sort of astonishing as a teacher. Uh, and what was astonishing about it is that um, he, you, re you really did feel like in the best cases, this guy who had been reading these texts for 50 years might might learn something, might have a new thought about it because of something you'd said. <laughs> it, that really felt like there was something on the line. But but so he was amazing at it. I went through at least two like really bad versions of it, learning, you know, learning to do it. I feel like I'm better at it now. But you know, the first thing that happens, and this I remember explicitly a number of times when this happened for me when I was a young teacher, the first thing that happens is that you think, I'm going to give the best lecture in the world. I mean, I can imagine it's like giving the best presentation in the world at a business me you know, meeting or whatever. I'm going to give it, it's going to be so chock full of so many beautiful, true things that everybody's going to leave amazed. And I did this as a guest lecturer in one of Bert's courses once. In fact, I was teaching, I was talking about Pascal, who this uh, New York Times article is roughly about. And I went in and I gave two hour and a half lectures in a row. And I remember, and I, they, they, were, they were just like so many beautifully laid out details. It all intertwined. The whole thing was a piece of art, like an artwork. And I got, I left with Bert after the second one and he said, well, I guess we should go do the postmortem. <laughs> and I thought, what, did I die up there? I mean, what happened? And he said, well, the thing is, you said so many true things that there was no place for any student to enter at all. <laughs> like teaching is not about telling other people what you know. Teaching is about inviting people into a conversation about a thing that they can see from what you say must be interesting. And, uh, and so that was a huge thing. So I did that. And, and of course, you know, at that point you just lecture for an hour and a half, nobody says anything, uh, but most of them are falling asleep. And then, so I, so I rebounded. And the thing that happened afterwards was that I, I would teach and I would think I'm gonna invite everybody to talk. And for about a decade, I would get on my course evaluations, these comments, you know, well, it's really great that Professor Kelly lets all the students talk, but I wish he would just shut them up and say things because, because what do we know? And he's not telling us anything. And I thought, well, that's the other, I've, the pendulum has swung. <laughs> and so your thought that there's this nonverbal, it's totally nonverbal is sort of right. It's not totally nonverbal. It's really important that people are engaging and by asking questions when it's appropriate. And it, that it's really important that I'm encouraging them to do that when it's appropriate, but but only when it's appropriate. And getting the sense for how to balance that is really really crucial. Um, so that yeah, so that's that's so you asked me to say more about the phenomenon. Yeah, that's what I, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the things that comes to mind for me is uh, you know let's say Donald Trump speech versus. Uh, any political speech I've ever been to, um, <laughs> and I've been to a lot of them, and they're like you can just see that there's this kind of like uh, I I've never been to Donald Trump's speech, but I've seen them on yeah. YouTube and I've heard a lot about them. Where you know there's this kind of like bond between Donald Trump and the audience, 
which is yeah. you're not present in any political speech that uh, I used to work in politics that I, I was yeah. ever involved in. Um, and well, I mean, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, go, go, go ahead. Well, I, you know what I was going to say, let's leave Donald Trump out of it because I don't want to talk about politics, but, but let, but let's, but, but it's clear, this much is clear. There is definitely a way to create a bond with an audience that is extremely unhealthy. And I, I, I um, you know, so Hitler had a great bond with his audiences. And I, th I assume we can all agree that Hitler was not a great guy. So let's repudiate him and repudiate whatever bond he had, was able to have with his audience. He had an extreme bond with his audience. And you're right. There were things that, that were brought out of those big community affairs that were, um, well, I mean, they were not monotonous. You know, they weren't the Kants. <laughs> I fear that they were closer to the Casanova, that they were sort of momentary, instantaneous, exuberant, but not, not really with a direction that everybody in it could reflectively recognize as valuable. Um, but but whatever, whatever the right thing to say about it is, getting the distinction between that phenomenon and what I'm trying to describe better be super important because, <laughs> but which is probably what you're dr driving at, right? <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I think somehow, I hope somehow, I'm definitely not uh, in the relation to my students that Hitler was in relation to the Hitler <laughs> youth. <laughs> better not be that way. <laughs> So when you're at Dunster House, um, you know, maybe you have a strategy, maybe you don't, but what, what would be the strategy to get, uh, to, to create this feeling of aliveness and to create this feeling of, like maybe of community would be the right word yeah. or of other people putting, feeling involved enough in the group and the project yeah. and the community that they put aside their own interests for the broader community. Yeah. Well, there's, I, I mean, I don't know if I have a strategy, I have maxims or something. <laughs> I have sort of guidelines that I think Cheryl and I together follow with the huge group of people who work with us. We have a big staff of tutors and other, other staff members who are you know, really what make the people that make it go on the ground. But what we're capable of doing as, you know, this is, it's like, I guess you could, uh, you know, think of it as a small company. Uh, you know, there's maybe 450 students who are here. They're something like the people working to, you know, bring something out of the community. <laughs> And then there's some management, you know, there's, we have 20 tutors who are graduate students who live on the entryways and we have other kinds of staff, dining hall staff, custodial staff, so on. So what do we do as the leaders of this? Well, I think there's at least two things. The first thing is that we try to set a tone, set a mood for the community. And we were, when we first took on the position seven years ago, um, we, uh, we asked the Dean who hired us. Well, what are we supposed to do? Oh, you're in charge of the mood of the place. Great. <laughs> How do I do that? <laughs> it doesn't seem like a kind of thing that you can do, but it turns out there are two different things that you can do. One is probably more important than the other. Um, you can be present. You can be present and really get to know the people. And you, that that is something that we do. I mean, that you have to do. You can, you have to be there and learn who's in your community, learn things about them and really want to care about who they are and, you know, how you can help them, yeah, uh, you know, sort of have a better experience in the community that, that, that we're sharing. So that's one thing. And that includes the dining hall servers and the custodial staff and the, and the students and the tutors and so on. That's one thing. And that's probably the most important. Uh, Sir Alex Ferguson, I don't know if you're a soccer or football fan, uh, but Sir Alex Ferguson was the great manager of, of Manchester United, this big soccer team in, in England. And 
he was he was knighted for his services to the to the you know to British culture uh, because it was such a great team. And he used to say, managing is about a thousand little conversations every day, and it just they don't even have to be big ones. It's just like checking in. So that's part of what sets the mood. It means that you become the person who's modeling the idea that caring for other people in your community is, is a value of the community. That's one thing. But, and then the other thing you can do is you can give people moments in, uh, you know, sort of big sort of ritualistic events where you say something about what the values of the community are so that they don't just see it, but they have a name for it. So those are two things that I think are, are really crucial. But the third thing, once you've done that, really what you have to do is listen because the in, in our community, what makes it go is that there are events that bring people together. So what we interviewed for the job, and I, I don't know how, maybe this is still analogous to a business. I've worked some in businesses. Um, the, uh, you know, one of the questions the students asked us was, well, you know, Dunster House doesn't have very many traditions. What traditions are you going to bring? And I thought, well, geez, that's, how am I going to do that? Like, that's like, <laughs> you know, telling people now we have fun and in this way, it, it seemed weird. And so what we tried to do was look into the history of the place to find traditions that were already kind of around that we could revivify. And we tried to listen very hard to the students and the tutors for ideas about what things they were invested in, because those were invariably the things that worked. So there's, there is a kind of top-down part, but there's very much a bottom-up part as well. Um, and I, I, we've usually found that when the students are already invested in making things work, we hardly have to do anything. They're going to work. <laughs> we can help, the, you know, talk through ways that will make it better and so on. But the en if the energy comes from them, it's a, it's going to win. It's a winner all the way. I really like how you put, or, you know, your uh, colleague put in charge of the mood of the place. Like, so, so as a entrepreneur, your primary job, and, and it's kind of like the, sort of lingo at least or corporate lingo yeah. is you know company culture yeah. right like that's your number one job as ceo is company culture and uh actually that company culture means nothing like i actually i don't know what what, what that even means um i uh, i've always referred to it <laughs> myself as style um mm -hmm. like work style instead of culture because I feel it's like culture can like it's just overused for too many things but i feel like the kind of like saying you are in charge of the mood of the place is so much more specifically actually what you're supposed to do as a ceo yeah. um yeah and yeah i just love i i love that you know th that way of framing it or the probably the word mood just like really encapsulates what as a leader your primary job is oh well i'm so happy to hear you say that because the the word mood is so important in this context and for reasons you know for obvious reasons i won't go into the whole philosophical history of it but it, it it's a very important word in he in heidegger's work for instance because the idea that what we do when we're at our best is speak into and cultivate a mood for a community that m improves the community, that makes the community better, um, is, is so different from the traditional philosophical idea of human beings that what we are is people, beings that think rational thoughts that are, you know, true, you know, whose truth is the main thing that you want to pay attention to. So, and it's much more mysterious, this mood thing. And so it's much less clear how to, how to do it. And I think in a way that's its virtue because the point is that it becomes something through the enactment of it by a community and, and, and getting, so just, there's a couple of practices 
that I think are really helpful, getting people to put names to the mood that they currently experience the, the community to be in. I will ask, I will go around asking my tutors all the time, you know, what's the mood of the place these days? How are people feeling? You know, what are they, are they anxious? Are they worried? Are they excited? You know, what, just asking people themselves to reflect on it, which is also asking them to not just to recognize it, but to care for it, to cultivate it, to, you know, help move it in a better direction if they can. And there's a certain mood that you want and that is different in a different context. Let's say a Dunster house, there's probably a mood that is more reflective, more passive, um, but like uh, than in a startup, right? Where in a startup, it's like the, I mean, it, it depends, right? Different startups have different, what they call cultures, but different moods, right? And, and I think that the best startups are aggressive and impatient and um uh you know there's probably a, a, a other um you know values i think for me I, i've always valued thoughtfulness uh as well yeah. but um like there's part of what's the mood is you know how are people feeling happy and, and content and stuff like that but part of it is also they like so, so i guess like what I'm saying is part of the mood is intrinsically good. Let's say people are, are stressed. That's probably bad. Um, but there are parts of the mood that are situationally good or situationally bad. So let's say if people at Dunster House are really aggressive, yeah. that's a little bit odd. If people in a startup are really passive and super contemplative, that's a little bit odd. But if you inverse them, it would be appropriate. So there's something about you know, there being situationally appropriate moods um, that, that you'd also want to measure, I, I guess, and kind of ask people about. Totally. I mean, moods are local. That's the, that's the way to say it. And, um, a, you know, what counts as a good mood for one situation, as you're saying, you know, could very well count as a terrible mood for a different situation. And getting the sense for what, you know, what what works for a mood for your community for a certain situation, that's like, a, that's a real skill that you can develop and that you can help others develop. Uh, and and yeah, so that's the, just just naming it and giving giving some vocabulary for it and asking people, about it, I think is is super helpful. But I, I I think that's the other thing that does is that it invites, just as with the teaching case, where you want to invite people into the discussion about the difficult. You don't want to tell them the facts about it. You want to co-create it. You want to invite them into the discussion because only then will everybody come together as a community around an understanding of the thing. So too in, in the business or in the, in the house kind of situation, that co-creating, um, that's a real delicate skill. And it starts by caring that others, caring about how others are doing. So when you were outlining this a few minutes ago, you kind of, so there, there are things that you considered to be top down. So kind of like setting yeah. the values, right? Yeah. Um, which I think the way you are outlining it was presumably you, you do want to like listen to people and, and set the values in a way that makes sense, but it's somewhat top down or primarily top down. Um, while you were talking about co-creating traditions with the members of the of, of the house of the organization yeah. and so i guess the question is like what is the purpose of these traditions what are the traditions and then how how is it why is it that the traditions should be co-created while the values should be more top down. Good. Well, I don't know that the val let me just speak to the last part. The val yeah. I don't know that they're top down exactly. They're also co-created. Um, but uh, somebody's got to articulate them. 
And when you're articulating them, you have to try right. to articulate them in a way that will reflect what people can already recognize is there, um, but will also really focus it. We'll make people, we'll give a name to it. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll give people the sense that we really came together around something. And how does this happen? I mean, we have, in the house situation, which is, I mean, this is probably different from, maybe not. Again, I've, I don't. I, I'm pretty sure it's all, you know, uh, once you get high level enough, yeah, uh, everything's all the same. Um, yeah, it could be. I mean, in the house situation, we have lots of celebratory events. We'll have dinners. We'll have a speaker come and give a talk and there'll be a dinner and, and, and or we'll just have a dinner that will celebrate a, the sophomore class or that will celebrate an event. And then we'll have other, um, other kinds of things. At many of these things, um, someone has to give a talk and it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, an hour and a half lecture, but it has to be something that's going to focus the community on what's special about the occasion, who, you know, why it's worth coming together to, to talk about it or to celebrate it. And so that's the opportunity where the manager or the leader ha, um, can, can go in and help the community get a sense of the kind of thing that they're all there about. But then you have to invite them to interpret it. You have to invite them to make it their own, to make it personal. And so it's 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 really so complicated. I've worked with a with I've worked with a professional sports team with a friend of mine that's very very um, uh, top team in the world. Uh, and so it's it's very high performance athletics, and we work with the coaches. And one thing the coaches, you know, coaches sometimes do is there's a kind of coach that just tells everyone exactly what they got to do, and that will work for a while. If you get people who are willing to follow the rules, they will go away. Um, but after a while, it just becomes too much. People people need to do more than just follow the rules. These are incredibly skilled athletes who are at the highest level in the world. And they're not just robots that follow some, someone else's directive. So there needs to be a way of inviting them into the discussion. And, and at a certain point, we asked the coaches to think about the possibility of having discussions with their, with their athletes um, on various occasions about a question in a situation, what counts as good in this situation? Uh, you know, what what is it that makes it good? And it might be that to do it good is to do this drill exactly right a hundred times in a row. But it might be that people say, no, actually, when I do it right a hundred times in a row, I'm not actually challenging myself. I'm not taking the right kind of risks. I'm not allowing myself to try a new way of doing it. So good is actually not doing it right 100 times in a row. Good is failing maybe 30% of the time, maybe more, <laughs> because it's from the failures that I'm going to learn how to do it even better than I ever could have before. So like that conversation, what counts as good in this project? What counts as good in this meeting? What is a potentially provocative question to invite people into? So I was taking notes here, and I think so this had never occurred to me. But I'm going to try to kind of like summarize these kind of raw thoughts. But so, so the first one is that really, as a leader, what you're doing is channeling the community. Or is this primarily what you're doing? Um, so when I let's say as a CEO, I set the company values, yeah. um, and, and, and they're always in flux. Um, so they change over time. And um, what what I'm really doing is I'm explicitly stating these values in a top down manner. Uh, but really, what I'm doing is channeling the reality of the actual values of the, the, the business, and giving them kind of explicit form. So I, I think that's, more of a, I think that's part of it. Um, it really has to involve a give and take, though. So you've emphasized the receptive aspect because I've been pushing on that because 
who thinks of a leader as the guy who mostly listens? That does that's a, a backwards way of thinking about it. So that's surprising, and you're right to emphasize it. Um, but in but in fact, you're doing that, but also articulating them in a way that gives them a flavor that people will recognize, but that you think improves them. That you think yeah. from your perspective is really what we ought to be aiming at. But you can't take values that have no relation to what everyone's already recognizing that th those won't take root. So you need the combination of them. Yeah. So what I wrote down was kind of like listening, understanding the people channeling and enhancing. Yeah. Um, good. Good. So it's kind focusing of like this. And enhancing. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So you like focus. So you channel them, you focus on the essence. So maybe your community has 50,000, like, like uh, 500 values and you're selecting three. Um, yeah. And then you're enhancing them to make them probably somewhat aspirational. And uh, maybe there are some values that you have, but you want to tamper down. Um, so in your selection, you're doing some enhancement, uh, you know, as well. And you're bringing in values from, in your case, the greater Harvard community, in a startup's case, the customers, um, yes. stuff yeah. like that. So there, there's a, and then also as an expert, let's say as a, for, for you as the head of Dunster House, or as a faculty dean of Dunster House, yes. yeah, you yeah. are more of an expert on life than the 18 year olds who populate the house. So there's kind of like some knowledge that you have that you use to enhance things. Like what, what's, what am I not getting about the enhancement? No, I think that's it. Focusing and enhancing, um, I, I think, are, are the right ways to think about it. Um, and I think, uh, you know, one of the one of the things that I find is that it takes over your life. Like I, I'm constantly when I'm reading things or it, it, the philosophy that I'm reading or whatever I'm reading in the news or novels or whatever, I'm always in the back of my mind asking myself the question, how does what's being described here relate to what we have? Is there anything from it that we could take that would fit and would enhance? Or is there anything that, um, you know, I think we're already doing that's brought out by contrast with this that I'd like to like to clarify. So it, it, do, it becomes all consuming to sort of lead a community like that because if you're doing it right, it's not just that there's the thousand little conversations. There's also engagement with the broader world, sort of by way of asking, what does this tell me? What can I bring from this back to my community? You give us, you know, if you give enough speeches, you know, you better have interesting things to say. <laughs> and you can't just, they, they mostly come from finding them, not from thinking them up from scratch. I mean, you just have to attend to the world. There's wisdom and and sort of great things to learn in lots of different situations. So that's, yeah, that's. Yeah. That's yeah, the, so it's kind of like listening to the people in the community, channeling, you know, the community, focusing it on what matters, aggregating from the broader world, other things, and using that to enhance you know, the reality of the community. And maybe that is creating aliveness for the people in the community. So, so actually, as a leader, when you are acting this out and you're enabling the community members to participate in this and you're giving them this, you know, final output that is explicit and real and kind of like almost physical uh and that is so you know focused and enhanced and great th that kind of like participation in the process of that is what it is a primary driver of the aliveness for the members of the community i i think that's the way i think of it yeah absolutely you said it very well i think what it does is it makes po it possible for people through their engagement in and commitment to the community to experience a sen this sense of, of aliveness. And part of that's because, um, 
you know, to be a part of the community is not to be the person who's constantly being told what to do, which is the deadening thing that Camus was talking about. It, you invite them into a different mode of engagement with themselves and others um, that if you throw yourself into it fully, sort of opens up the possibility of a kind of aliveness through community. And the reason why it's possible for community members to put aside their own interests for the interests of the group is because the interests of the group are their interests or are, are yes. them, but enhanced. Exactly. And not only that, they, they have this feature. It's the feature I started out with looking into your lover's face where you look at them and you like when you, when you experience the, you know, the community coming together on an occasion, in a situation where everyone is really brought out at their best. When you experience that, it's like looking into your lover's face. You know it's there. <laughs> you can feel it, but no single thing that you look at it is the thing it's reducible to. No, you know, that person's speech or that person's comment, none of that is what it was that you were feeling. It was all part of it, but somehow what you were feeling was the mysterious thing that was underneath that and beyond that making it possible. And that's the feeling, that is the feeling of aliveness. And it comes out in, in communities that are brought out at their best. So I want to wrap this up because we're at the end of our yeah. uh, you know, time. But, uh, you know, this has made clear to me so many things that I knew were true or had been told to do. So, for example, like, why as a leader should you be listening to the people should you be that, that, that you lead why should you spend so much time doing that like or like why yeah. should you understand who they are as people and I, I i mean the answer is that because if you don't understand who they are you can't channel them and if you can't channel them you are not leading and yeah. that is I guess obvious, but not wasn't to me or wasn't clear to yeah. me. Um, yeah. There's so much in here that's just like so it makes so much that, that was fuzzy in my in in my thinking. Uh, you know, clear. So so thank you um, for this, Sean. Um, yeah. I, uh, I I've gotten so many like when when I listen to your uh, classes, um, I always have all these ideas. Um, and I, that I can apply, I guess I'm kind of like aggregating from other, yeah. from you to yeah. enhance things. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's such an honor to, and, um, you know, pleasure to discuss it with you in, in, in more depth. Um, before we go, where can, uh, you know, people find you? I guess Twitter is the best oh. place to get things from you or Harvard's website. Yeah, for I for the moment I use Twitter a little bit or X now. I don't know what its future is. <laughs> um, but I do post things there. And uh there's yeah, I'm pretty easy to find uh on my Harvard website. And I've been on some podcasts that you can listen to. Um, including yeah, the Lex Friedman podcast. Yeah, that was one. And and Bert Dreyfus, whom I mentioned, and I wrote a wrote a book that's called All Things Shining, that is a kind of exploration, I guess, of some of these ideas. I, I would, can I just end with one thing though, Julian? Please do, I, I have all the time quick, in the world. It's so I, wanted to I had a quick, I just wanted to leave you, you, you were saying sort of what are these rituals? And I wanted to give you an example of one, which is just, I mean, you can borrow it if you want. I'm busy trying to send it out into the world. But I had a philosopher friend named Albert Borgmann who died recently. Um, and he was an amazing German philosopher who taught in the US. And um, he taught me something that I, that I turned into a kind of toast that I use on various occasions for the house. And we now call it the Dunster House Toast. And it works really well in situations where the community has been brought together and everyone can feel it. And they, wanna, they, want, they want something to remember it by. <laughs> and so the toast goes like this. 
you can adapt it how you like, but it says, um, may there be many times in your life and may this be one of them about which you can say, there's no place I'd rather be. There's no thing I'd rather be doing. There's no buddy I'd rather be doing it with. And this I will remember well. And it's like magic words. It's kind of, <laughs> it's so deep and meaningful. I'm so grateful to Albert for having taught me his version of it. But it really feels like if you can feel that way, then it feels alive. And, and so that's. And if you can create that within your business. Yes. That's actually it's probably the most good that you can create in the world um yeah. let, let, like forget you know whatever impact you have outside of your business yeah. which will be what it is but like yeah. if you can create that feeling um for everyone who's involved in your business you're just creating so much good for 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 actual people um absolutely and, yeah. and, and w w w it's just like such a kind of design. Like, why would you create a business that doesn't do that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I, I think there there are many reasons to create businesses, and not of them, not all of them are are that. But I I wish more of them were. I I, I think that's what it could be. Um, so so yeah. um, final call to action for everyone's so obviously uh, you know subscribe uh, and you know like this video if you're on YouTube. Uh, and uh, if you know anyone who is leading a uh, you know business or s thinking of starting a business, uh, it's probably one of the most important things for them to understand, or at least it's one of the things I'm most happy as a uh, leader to understand now. Uh, so, so I highly encourage you to share this with them. And um, uh, uh, Sean, I will uh, end the stream. Okay.